Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Spirit of Grace Church. I'm so thankful that you're here tonight and uh, looking forward to sharing what I believe the Lord has laid on my heart for us today uh, in drawing closer to Him. And I want to teach tonight, I think, on um, by asking this question. Do you want to be bitter or better? <laughs> Do you want to be bitter or better? And... Uh, I want to maybe approach that question maybe from a little bit of a different uh, perspective tonight that you may have heard, uh, but I, I'm, I'm glad that God has seen fit to make us better more than bitter. Amen. So would you just bow your heads with me tonight and let's uh, just ask God to step into this time that we have and open up his word and make it alive in us. Jesus, we love you. I thank you, God, for all those that are here tonight. I'm asking you to go into every room, wherever this is being watched or listened to. And I'm asking you, Lord, just to allow it to echo in our spirits and our hearts and make us and form us into what you want us to become. Your word is so very powerful. And I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, to allow it to take up root in us tonight. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm reading from John chapter 1. And uh, when you're talking bitter versus better, it may come as kind of a different type of scripture to use, but I'm reading from John chapter 1, verse uh, number 17, and I'm reading from the ESV. It says, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Law was given to Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for grace tonight. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about what causes us to become bitter or better. We have a choice uh, to, to either be bitter or better. And uh, it, it really comes down somewhat to perspective. Let me, let me say it to you this way. How you respond to the issues of life, or let me use another word besides how, but through which lens you approach the issues of life will make you either bitter or better. And the principle that we read in this scripture is simply this. If you approach life through a lens of the law, you are approaching life uh, that will end up making you bitter. And I'll explain that in a minute. But if you are approaching your issues of life through the perspective or the lens of uh, the power of grace, you will end up being better. I'm just turning my phone off just to make sure I don't get interrupted. Sorry about that. Uh, praise God. If you're a law person, uh, you're probably headed towards bitterness more than the bettering of your life. And if you're a grace person, you're probably going to have a better chance at getting better. And what I mean by that is simply this. People that view their life through the lens of the law, and when I talk law, I'm talking justice, I'm talking about rights, I'm talking about the breakdown even of the Old Testament. Um, they use the word should a lot. He should come back and fix that for free. Uh, after all, it's only been six years since he fixed it and didn't fix it the right way the first time. So he should come back. She shouldn't have cut in front of us in, in, in the aisle. You see, law people often banter about fairness and about our rights. It's not fair that we have to deal with this. and It's not fair that we have to deal with that. They should just do their part. And so people that look at life through the lens of law are the ones that decide what's fair and the way that things should be and the way people should act. And they spend their life then in a series of disappointments, anger, and even resentment because of what they thought should be wasn't actually happening, okay? 
And what that does is that carries over and it in, introduces both a guilt and a bitterness. The guilt comes into us because even though our perception is that this is what's right and this is what they should be doing, in the back of our mind, we know that we should be doing the same thing. And then bitterness creeps in because we've been disappointed, not because somebody has treated us poorly, but they treated us in such a way that they shouldn't have done. And uh, you don't deserve it. And, and let me just say this, all of those things may be accurate. When somebody doesn't fix something the right way, they should do it for free and fix it for free. That, that is just, that is, that is good, it's not bad. And so what I'm talking about here is not bad, it's talking about the, the end part of life. So for instance, bitterness doesn't spring forth be just only because of something that, bad, that, that, that was bad has happened to you. Okay, so you don't get bitter just because somebody treated you in an abusive way. You don't get bitter. I mean, those are that's a negative spurning of bitterness. But bitterness can spring up in us because we look through the eyes of law or facts or data instead of through the law of grace. You see, data says this is what you should get. Data says this is what you have earned. And when that doesn't happen, data says or law says you should treat me in this manner. And when that doesn't happen, I'm going to be disappointed. And my, disappointed, my disappointment is going to plant a seed in me that if I allow it to, that seed will spring forth in bitterness and resentment. The people of grace, though, and, and I shouldn't, be, because it's not the people of grace, it's their viewpoint, it's their perspective. They're looking at things through the concept of grace. They use the words thank you a lot, <laughs> uh, especially when they're talking to God, but they don't presume what should be. They don't presume, presume what is good and bad for us. They give a different perspective, and that perspective comes from the concept of grace, which there's a bunch of ways to describe grace, but the, the basic foundation of grace is simply unmerited favor. Un, unmerited favor. And so grace people tend to take things as they come. So when something happens, it's not something that springs up a, a justice in them. They just accept what happened and they give favor to that person and they move on. Okay, part of grace is forgiveness. Forgiveness is not for the person that created the act that needs forgiveness. It's always forgiveness is created for the person upon whom the act was done. Because forgiveness is what releases the injustice that was done to us. The, a lot of times the situation or the person that is causing the injustice doesn't even realize that they're doing it. And they don't realize that because we are looking through the lens of law that you shouldn't do, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't be that, you shouldn't treat me that way. That's not right. That is offensive. That that hurts me. That damages me. Now I'm going to hold a grudge against you. Okay? They don't even know that. So forgiveness is simply the releasing of the grudge. Uh, forgiveness is the releasing of the law, the shoulda, coulda, the, the, the thing that they should have done, that you're releasing them from that. Well, what ends up happening is what you're really releasing is your true choice, your option of dealing with the situation the way it is. You and I, it's one of the reasons, let me say it this way, it's one of the reasons why I believe that Paul writes in Thessalonians that in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything give thanks. Thanks is an aspect of grace. See, when you look at every situation through what Jesus has brought into your life, the Bible, we, the passage we read said grace and truth came by Jesus. So when you 
operate on a grace level instead of a law level. You are operating on a Jesus level instead of a Moses level. And when you're operating on a Jesus level, everything's going to turn out a whole lot better. And that's why we need to be thankful. And, and so when we are dealing with people from the law, we are dealing with people. Let me, we're really doing God's job. When you look at situations and you look at people with the idea that they should do this and it should be done this way and it should be happened this way. And if it's not, then I'm going to get irritated because that's not fair. That's not right. Here's what you're doing. You're saying, I'm as God going to determine what's right and what's wrong. And Jesus came to fulfill the law, which means he doesn't get rid of all of the things of the law. But what he does do is he adds and he shifts the perspective of law. Law now today is not the thing that tells us how to draw closer to God or how to draw closer to Jesus. Okay, I, I, I need to try to make this clear to somebody tonight. Before Christ, the Bible says it this way, I believe it's in Galatians, that the law was given to be a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. Okay, well, Christ has come. And so what Christ does is he doesn't abolish the law. He just gives us a different perspective of the law. While the law of the Old Testament was looking forward to Christ, okay, follow me here, to where grace was going to be, since Jesus came, we now look back we use the law to look back to Christ because the price is already paid. Well, if we're going to look back to the cross where the law was fulfilled and the law was, was the Bible calls it this, says it this way, I believe it's in Ephesians, that the law was canceled. What we're really doing is, is we're looking at the law now through the eyes of grace instead of the eyes of justice. The eyes of justice, the law was good to take care of the things that were just, but the punishment also was lined up with the law of justice. But now because of what Christ did, he became the, the price for us. He became the justice for us that now when we look at the law, it doesn't mean that we throw the law out, but we look at it through the lens of grace that says he's already paid the penalty. So if I look through that lens, I get better. If I look through the lens that looks into justice because of the law, I get bitter. And so uh, uh, let me go on and, and, and try to explain this a little bit deeper because I think sometimes we get this idea that um, it, it's up to us to decide what's right and what's wrong. But the Bible told us, we read it tonight, that grace and truth, truth is, is the thing that's right all the time, okay? It's always what it is. And that and grace mixed together reveal the law or the justice. And, and here's, here's what I, this is what I want to say is we spend so much time battling in the wrong arenas uh, where we need to step out of the arenas that we think and step into the arenas that God has chosen. And here, here's what I mean by that. Is Jesus spent very little time, if any, talking about the ills and coming against the ills of society. In fact, he said it to this way, render under Caesar the things that are Caesar and unto God the things that are God. He spent very little time in his ministry dealing with societal issues. He spent the vast majority of his time battling, if you will, or coming against or dealing with the religious issues of the day. And unfortunately, we have misplaced this concept and we have accepted that religion is righteous and that society is unrighteous. Now, don't get me wrong. Society is unrighteous. Society is things that we have to live in, and, and Jesus said it this way, 
you are in the world, but not of the world. We, we deal with all of those things. But Jesus spent more of his time with religious people and really blasting the concept of religion because what religion does, religion is the expression of law. Now, when I say law, I'm not talking about thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, although that's part of it. What I'm really talking about is the view of justice versus injustice. What I'm talking about is how we operate our lives, how we perceive situations in our lives. Do we look at it as a stricture? Do we look at it as a list of do's and don'ts that we mark off or we, we cancel out or we, we abide by? You see, religion has become the modern day law and God hates religion. God desires relationship. And, and so I want to just talk for just a couple of minutes because just like we said in John 1, law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. Jesus came to take care of the law by becoming the, 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 the uh, sacrifice for the punishment or the penalty of those laws so that you and I would have unmerited favor. And what's happened throughout the history of the church and, and through people that claim to be Christians is we have allowed, maybe not quote unquote, the Old Testament law to come into our lives, but we have brought in another man-made expression of law, which we would call religion. Because let me put it to you this way. I looked up the definition of religion, and there's a bunch of them. There's a whole mess of them. Um, but what I want to pull from each one of these is simply some key words that, come, that stuck, stick out from the page for me. Number one, it was the word order. It is an order. It is a structure. It is it is based off of somebody else's um, perception, concepts, ideas, and codified into an order. Uh, another word that stuck out to me was an organized system of beliefs and worship with a code of ethics and philosophy. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I believe that we need to worship properly. I believe that our lives need to reflect the gospel property. I believe in ethics. I believe in the way we think will determine how we, we end up. But what I want to pull out of this is the concept of religion is an organized structure of beliefs or systems or an order, and we get locked into that organized system or order, and that begins to be the thing that defines us instead of our relationship with Jesus. Uh, hold on, I'll, I'll tie all this together, I hope. Uh, another thing that stuck out, stood out from the page was that religion is a set of beliefs, a set of practices, or a set of values. Okay? Now, I believe in all three of those. I believe in the fact that we have to believe properly. I believe that our lives have to practice or Another word for practice is uh, operating and using and ministering and living, okay? I believe that we have to do those appropriately and according to Scripture. I believe in proper values. But what I am trying to share with you today is your if your life is solely around these things, you're missing the grace part of it. You're only operating in the law part of it or in that just part of it. And so when somebody doesn't believe exactly the way you believe, when they don't practice their life the way you think they should practice their life, or their values don't match your values because you have become so locked into your set of certain beliefs, certain practices, and certain values, then that person is wrong and you're right, and because there is no room for grace, there is the opportunity for you to become bitter towards the person whose set of religious principles doesn't line up with yours. Okay? Again, and I qualify this, don't get me wrong, I believe that the Bible 
is the absolute authority in describing and, and in directing our footsteps and our understandings. But the Bible is based off of who the Word actually is. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the, of the full of grace and truth. If I want to have the right viewpoint, if I want to have the right perspective, it's always got to flow through Jesus, who is full of grace and truth. And that means that it flows through a relationship and not necessarily a religion. I found this as well. Uh, these are definitions just off of Google. Blame the internet. But the expression of conduct and ritual practices, religion, is the expression of conduct and ritual practices. Now, let me say this. I believe in right conduct. I believe in the proper uh, carrying out of the things of the Word of God. But I believe more strongly that if I can lead you to Jesus, not based on what my religion is, but based on what my relationship is, Jesus will take care of your religion. Jesus will lead it to the, to the proper level of understanding. And so let me sum up this, this conversation here about religion this way. Religion is based in law, okay, it's based in that structure, that organization of beliefs, that system, that, that set of beliefs, practice, values, that conduct, that it's, it's all set in what you do, I guess is how I should say it, which what you do is the law. Religion is based on law so that it can make you become bitter. But relationship is based on grace or unmerited favor from the Lord, and thus it makes you better. Because when I look at somebody who doesn't level up with my religion and I can treat them with grace, a friendship can be born and a friendship that can flourish. But when I separate myself, not based on my relationship, but based on my religion or my viewpoint or my set of beliefs or my ethics that God has planted in me, then I am separating myself from the opportunity to give them unmerited favor. He's given me so much grace in my life. Who am I to withhold grace from another? Who am I to treat that person that doesn't see eye to eye? How, why do I need to get mad and upset? Why do I need to get, especially for those that don't even know Jesus, have never had a relationship. Oh, they may have gone to church their whole life, but their church has become a habit to them. The Bible says that, that, that Christ can become of no effect in Galatians 5. And you can read several things into that. But one of them is that you can learn how to do things without Christ being because it is a religion. It is an organizational system of conduct and belief and worship with a code of ethics and a certain philosophy and a certain viewpoint. It is a set of beliefs that you can live and operate but you're not operating based off of a relationship. You see, religion, and I'm just about done here tonight, but religion is a distortion of Jesus. Religion tries to domesticate a God who is more wild, is bigger and better than any little... Here's the example that I'll give you, okay? The, the, the religious leaders bring the woman who, according to the law, had every right to be stoned to death. And yet, what does Jesus do? He sits down or kneels down and he writes in the sand and he doesn't condemn her. What was he doing? He was looking through the eyes of, uh, he was looking at religion or as law through the eyes of grace and giving that lady unmerited favor. She didn't deserve it. She didn't do anything to earn it. All she did was get charged before Jesus and Jesus released her based off of a relationship or off of grace and not off of the strictures of the law. You see, religion creates an idea of the thing instead of the thing itself. 
So all those sets of beliefs and those principles, while while oftentimes they, they mean good and they're supposed to be good, that's what becomes the thing instead of Jesus. And, and, and I'm here to tell you that we need to preach Jesus and let religion fall under the aura of grace instead of the aura of law, and then all of us will become better and there will be less bitterness. Amen. I, I, I believe that wholeheartedly. Now listen, I don't want somebody leaving this time that we have together saying, pastor saying, you can go do whatever you want to do and, and act however you want to act. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I act the way I act. I am the way I am, not because I have kept the law, but because I have embraced his grace. And because I have embraced his grace, I can treat you through his grace and not through the law. There's things that I do not do because God in his wisdom has planted the seed in me and it has become my core tenant. It may not be something damaging to you, but for me, that is the structure that God wants me to live in. But when I look at you, you may not line up to the way my stricture is. You may look at something a little bit differently, but because grace is in me, I can look at you through the eyes of grace and not maybe accept it uh, exactly what you're doing or approve of it, but I can accept you. I can accept you as the person that God is working on. At the same time, you become a reflection to me that says he's still working on me. Because what religion does, religion tells you that if you do all of these things, you're right with God. If you do all of these structures and you have that core set of beliefs, and that core set of beliefs are are, are what you think is right, and the principles are right, and, and, and the, the, the practices are right, and the expressions of worship are right, and all of those things are right, what you have done is you have locked up a mindset that says you're okay with Jesus. Not because you have a relationship, but because you have attached religion to Jesus, and religion is, is a distortion of relationship, and so your relationship, you have become related to the thus th thou shalt and thou shalt nots of your structure and your strictures and your constraining instead of doing thou shalt not based off of the fact that Jesus is your friend. Jesus is your friend. And so you domesticate, if you will, God. You take away the power and the adventure and the the the. Uh, overwhelming awe of God. Listen, creation isn't isn't found in, in a lab. Creation is is huge and everywhere. We've barely touched the, scra the the surface of it. And so, what religion does? Religion veils the truth and the beauty, while Jesus amplifies the truth and the love and the beauty of who He is. We. We gravitate to religion because religion is easier. Uh, let me put it to you this way. Um, operating at a level of religion is easier because it allows us to stay at a surface level and we soon learn how to operate within the system within religion, and we fail to realize that there are times where God wants to take us deeper. God wants to take us into arenas that would freak us out that doesn't make any sense. And if it goes against the system that we are in, what we have done is we are locking God out of the opportunity to lead us and be the light and salt in a different area of ministry. You see, Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes how we think, how we live, how we act, how we serve, how we work, how we lead. He changes how we approach our jobs. He changes how we lead in our homes. He changes. Why? Because it's a relationship and relationships change over time. 
My relationship with my wife today is much different than my relationship when I met her in 1988. My relationship with her is a lot different now than it was a year ago. Why? Because we're constantly growing in relationship with one another and there's arenas that we have walked into as a couple that we would have never walked into back in the day when we were single or when we were newly together. Why? Because life is constantly changing. And if I would have looked and said, okay, this is my religious box for Trisha and said, okay, I'm not, I'm just, I'm, all I'm going to do is this and, and then I'll be good. All I'm going to do is make sure she has uh, a roof over her head and make sure that she feels secure. Then I don't have to worry about anything else because I, that's my religion of marriages. And, 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 but that's not reality. Reality is, yes, my wife wants to feel secure. Yes, we want to have a roof over our head. Yes, we want to, to, to make sure we have food on the table. But our relationship has to grow and is growing even still today, much deeper and more personal. And we're seeing things like never before. That's what Jesus wants from his bride. He doesn't want us to just say, okay, if I can just do these 10 things or five things, then I'm good and I don't have to worry about anything. No, he's wanting to have an intertwined relationship where he communicates with us. We communicate with him. We grow in him. He grows in us. What is that? Grace. Because none of us deserve it. We deserve the law. We deserve the justice, but because he released grace when he was born and he, he impregnated the church with grace when the church was born, we are people of grace, of unmerited favor. And if he has unmerited favor for me, I've got to step out of my, my philosophy of religion and step into a relationship with him. It's the reason why I tell you, don't take my word for something. Go search it out for yourself. Go grow in your relationship with him for yourself. Are there guidelines? There's guidelines. There's boundaries of scripture. But if the scripture is the thing that's doing it, then the scripture is alive because the scripture is a living being. His name is Jesus. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Jesus is the is that flesh. And so if you are interacting with the Bible and his word, you're interacting with Jesus. So don't step into the concept of a box. Jesus fought against the religious leaders because he wanted to have a relationship with his people. And I challenge you tonight to open your eyes and let his relationship flourish in your life and allow you not to get so worried about the strictures and the structures and the set of the beliefs and and let God minister to you in a personal way. I'd rather have relationship than a list of things that I should and shouldn't do. Because if I have a list of things that I should or shouldn't do, I will carry that list over to the people that are around me. And in my mind, I will say, well, that means they shouldn't do it either. And when they do something, then it opens up the opportunity for that seed of bitterness. But if I'm operating in grace and relationship, I don't have to allow the bitterness. I can let the relationship grow. I hope this has helped somebody. I hope you who are out there that are beating yourself up because of mistakes that you have made that have violated the things of religion, and violated the structures and the boundaries and the set of principles and worship and actions. And because you have violated the religious structure of your life, and I'm not talking about denominations tonight. I'm not talking about Lutheran, Baptist, Pentecostal, Assembly. I'm not talking about any. I'm talking about the concept of religion, that set of beliefs that you have built up in your life, that you live your life by. Is it based off of law or is it based off of what Jesus has given to you as a relationship? Because if you break them, Jesus doesn't destroy you. He embraces you. He may chastise you and correct you, but he's always going to love you. You are not a failure. 
You are never a failure if you break religion. And you're really never a failure if you break relationship because God is always willing for somebody to come back. But when you break religion, you're breaking a set of codes that, yeah, they may help you, but Jesus is the one that's on the other side of the code. Get to Jesus and he'll take care of you and your code of conduct or your, your religion, if you will. I'm often asked, well, what religion are you? <laughs> I'm not a religion. I, I, I don't operate in a religion atmosphere. I operate in a grace-filled atmosphere, in a Jesus atmosphere. I'm not going to tell you how to get to heaven. I'm going to tell you how to get to Jesus. I'm not going to tell you the thus and thou shalts that are not in his word. I'm going to tell you Jesus has a big enough uh, and wise enough ability to have a relationship with you, and he will. What I will help you with is listening for the word of God in your life and in your circumstance and in your situation and help you learn to hear and have a relationship with Jesus so that you can be better and not bitter. I close with this. There is not one of us that is hearing this, including the one speaking, that is perfect. We all fall short in relationship. We all fall short in everything that we do for Jesus. But when you fall short, relationship is based on grace and unmerited favor that we can fall back into and not a bitterness of law that we fall upon. I hope that helps somebody tonight. I feel the presence of the Lord here in the office as I'm sharing this with you and, and I can only imagine what's going on in some of your minds. You have allowed religion to weigh heavy on you because you can't measure up to religion. Or when you try to measure up, it wears you out. Stop trying to measure up to religion and start having a relationship and let him love you and let his grace and unmerited favor surround you and allow him to dictate the paths of your life and allow him to tell you, you need to change this. You need, to, you, you need to adjust this. You need to cut this off. You need to accept that Jesus will do that for us. Your religion won't. And so I challenge you to find Jesus in a special way tonight. Thank you for being with us. Would you bow your heads uh, tonight with me as I close in prayer? Lord, I pray that this message comes clear. Lord, I pray that those that hear it understand that I'm not coming against churches. I'm not coming against denominations. I'm coming against the concept of the law versus the concept of grace and the perspective that we have through the law versus grace and relationship through rules. I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, to minister and to set free those that have been bound up by religious structure and allow them to sense the, the adventure of their relationship with you and the journey that you can lead them on on an individual basis. Lord, we'll be careful to give you praise and glory until we return again together. And should you tarry and not call us home, we'll gather together again in like-minded faith. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May you have a very blessed rest of the week. If you are local here, we'll be in church on Sunday. We have one service. It's family day at 945. We'll have some donuts and refreshments. And then at 1030, We'll go into our worship service and just have a great time together. Come expecting a move of the Lord. Praise God and have a great rest of the week.